the Healing Through Love podcast with Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. In episode 120, join Jennifer Parker as she shares how to heal from the psychological effects of coercive control and rebuild self-confidence. Survivors don't need somebody to tell them what to do. They've, they've got that plenty of that. They need encouragement for developing that themselves. And, um, you know, unless you're asked, if you're, if you're an ally or if you're a therapist, unless you're asked for suggestions, then I hesitate. You know, it's important to, um, to encourage people to think, you know, to ask them questions. Like, what do you need from me? If you're a friend or you're a family member, what what do you need from me? I'm concerned. And then giving those messages about you don't deserve this. That is abuse, you know, because they may question it. Am I making too big a deal about whatever it is, especially with emotional abuse that often happens? And I will repeat it again. It's like emotional abuse, mental abuse, coercive behavior really is spiritual abuse, it, dam- it, it pushes down your spirit, your ability to express who you are as an individual. The Healing Through Love podcast with Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. Welcome to another episode of Healing Through Love. Each week, we share ideas, experiences, and resources to increase the awareness of domestic and family violence and to empower survivors to grow and thrive. We talk with experts who share their advice or with people who have experienced abuse, no matter where they are on their journey. This is all about healing through love. And now, here are your hosts, Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. Welcome to the Healing Through Love podcast, a space where stories of strength, resilience and transformation unfold. I'm your host, Charlene Lynch, and I'm honoured to be your guide in this journey of empowering and healing. Today, we have a very special episode tailored just for you, whether you're driving the car or sipping a cup of tea or just taking time out for yourself. I want you to know that you're in a safe place. Healing Through Love is more than a podcast. It's a community, a beacon of hope, a reminder that you are not alone. In this episode, we have a guest who will share a story that resonates at the core of our mission, a story that illuminates the power of love, resilience, and unwavering strength that lies within each of us. So settle back and take a deep breath and let the healing begin. But before today's inspiring narrative, just a quick reminder, that if you find value in our episode, consider supporting us by subscribing, sharing, and leaving a review. Your engagement helps us reach the hearts and spread the message of healing through love. Today, our very, very special guest is Jennifer Parker. And Jennifer's eyes were open to intimate partner abuse when she had an internship as a domestic abuse shelter in 1982. So that's a few years ago. And then she's progressed from then to now writing a book. Hello, Jennifer. How are you? Hi, I am very good. I'm so glad to be part of this show. And I really share your mission to reach people and to people in their healing. Oh, thank you so much. It is beautiful to have these lovely conversations. Now, there's a story that got you where you are. I'd love it if it's okay, Jennifer. Is it okay to share? Yeah, definitely. So... When I was in my early 30s, I went through a divorce, the crisis of a divorce, and uh, I had two children. I'd been married for 10 years, and it was just something that I couldn't believe was happening to me. Uh, So that was a crisis, and it was also a big learning opportunity. So because of that divorce, I needed to kind of brush up on my skills. I had a psychology degree, a bachelor's degree. But I needed to brush up because I had not been working outside the home that much. So I was uh, put in to a practicum at a what they called then a battered women's shelter. And I knew nothing about domestic abuse, I thought. (laughs) So that was the big wake up call for me, because what I realized in working with the the, um, women there, it was only women at the time. What I realized is that, hmm, 
No, I wasn't physically abused, but I, their experiences resonate with me much more than I thought. And then I've, I also grew up in a family where my father was extremely dominant and treated my mother more like a child than a partner. And so I really realized that, oh, man, this is something that's happening in society. I could identify with it personally. And I was at a time of growth, learning. I became a feminist. I was uh, really growing into myself and, and realizing how much I had been dominated emotionally. And uh, I decided that I was going to dedicate myself when I went to graduate school to get my clinical degree to be a therapist that I wanted to specialize in working with intimate partner abuse. Mm -hmm. So I spent many years as a therapist working with mental illness or mental health issues and in general, but especially working with trauma and especially working with intimate partner abuse. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got. Mm -hmm. That's after, after many years, I decided I love what watching people be empowered. I mean, the work can be difficult, but I developed a group curriculum and I saw how that benefited for people, people. And I wanted to write a book that also would reach more people. So that's how I got to the book. And it took me some time since I was working full time that as I neared retirement as a therapist, then I published that book. Mm. So you seek. That's huge. Now, do you still, so, so you're retired now, is that right? I'm retired as a therapist. I, I call it, I'm refired. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm working <laughs> a lot every day, doing podcasts, doing training for therapists in terms of the effective ways that I found to work with survivors mm, okay. and marketing my book. So, so, so yes. a majority of the people that you work with are therapists. So that's great because a lot of the people that listen to our podcast are therapists themselves and have a heart for change, which that sounds like exactly what you do, Jennifer, have a heart for change. So so it's a huge subject and you've chosen a narrow window to have a look at. So can you just unpack for the listeners that are maybe not aware um, cohesive control and how that works and why is that different and why does it fit under the banner of domestic abuse or domestic violence? Definitely, definitely. Well, first of all, I want to just acknowledge that coercive control was a term that came from Evan Stark in the in, in the beginning. Uh, he wrote a book called Coercive Control that is an excellent book. Uh, unfortunately, he recently passed, but he really contributed to the movement a great deal. Um, and um, so that coercive control, there's been many terms that people use, and I still use all of them, domestic abuse, domestic violence, uh, controlling behavior. And I found that coercive control is really helpful because, you know, sometimes when people talk about controlling behavior, oh, I need to be the one who needs to, to uh, drive the car or something like that because of maybe some experiences they've had in their life. That isn't coercive control. So coercive control really identifies, a cons it, it applies to a consistent pattern of behavior that is designed to dominate in an intimate partner relationship. Mm -hmm. Although I will also say that there are ways in which we have co course of control throughout our society and other contexts like politically, religiously, and so forth. But we're gonna stay within intimate relationships right now. Uh, uh, that's so, so how connected is it to narcissism? Oh, definitely very connected. Many times, I mean, narcissists often use coercive control. Does it, you know, if you're talking about a personality disorder, not everybody always has a personality disorder. You don't have to have narcissistic in order to use course of control. But uh, there are many who uh, do get in relationships that it, they do narcissist use course of control. So it's a consistent pattern of behavior that is designed to dominate you to kind of, I call it, it's really spiritual abuse at heart because it keeps you from being you. It prevents that. And certainly we see that, you know, it's, it's easier for many people to see with physical abuse, how that keeps somebody from being themselves. But really coercive control involves, uh, I have a coercive control checklist that I developed in my book and that I use in my training 
And that is 12 different things. And only two of them are physical, physical abuse and sexual abuse. The others are all emotional ways, mental ways that people are controlled, that really their, their civil rights are taken away from them, or they suffer if they do exercise them. Mm, so, so are you educating the survivors or are you educating the abusers? Like who, so what's your inroad to this conversation? I have a dual role. So first of all, I did therapy with survivors. And so my book, I wrote my book to reach more survivors, but I, it is also designed to be helpful to therapists because in there, there's lots of, well, there's lots of information that not every therapist has, uh, but also there are reflections that guide survivors through kind of thinking through what I present in the book so that they can decide what applies to them and what doesn't. And those reflections can be really helpful for therapists too, in terms of thinking about, oh, maybe these are some good questions or a direction that I can go in the therapy. Mm. So... So yeah. as a survivor myself um, and now out the other side and, and sort of now bulletproof really and not even remotely attractive to someone who would want to do me harm, I know that it's my inside work, my internal work that has made me the way that I am now not attractive to people that would consider that as an, a way to behave. So it, what can we do to help survivors become less attractive to people that behave that way? That's a good question. One section of my book actually deals with that in terms of talking about the different, I call them roads in the book that people go down that make them more vulnerable. And so um, certainly identifying, like if you're a person who learned um, that it's not feminine to be assertive, Sometimes that happens. I know I had a person in my group one time when we got to the assertiveness portion of the group, she said, this just doesn't feel right. This isn't feminine because that's what it, in her family, it was like really frowned upon, punished if, if you were assertive, if you spoke up, if you asked for what you needed, if you took care of yourself, those kinds of things. And so that's an example of something that if that's true for you, that you um, were not encouraged to be assertive, that maybe you were even discouraged from that, learning how to do that. First of all, it involves learning you have the right, right? You have to think that you have the right to speak up for yourself or to say no, or to express your opinion in order to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so this is um, an educational piece as well for people to understand this, it is a thing and this is what it looks like. And so the people that are going to be leaning into this though would be people who are receiving on the receiving end, not on the giving end, because otherwise they've got their blinkers on, they're not even looking for this. Is that right? Exactly. No, it's definitely directed towards survivors and those who work with them. Hmm. So are there key pieces of advice that you can give people once they've had that awakening that this is the reality that they're living in, that steps that they can maybe take to move forward? Definitely. Well, first of all, I just want to acknowledge that in moving forward, that can be the most dangerous time sometimes for many people. So it's like, take your time, find people, first of all, if you don't have a support network of people who know about what's going on, begin to develop that because it's very important. Oftentimes people become isolated for a couple of reasons. One, maybe their partner has isolated them. They, they won't allow them to see friends or um, even family sometimes. But the other reason they become isolated is because they're embarrassed and they take, they feel like somehow it's a reflection on them what their partner is doing. And maybe they're still invested in the relationship, so they don't want other people to know. So therefore, they distance themselves from them because they're afraid that that what how what they're going to think. Mm. So it's very to build back that support network to reach out to people. Sometimes finding a good therapist is the first step for some people, um, but you know it's important to broaden that. Support groups can be really helpful, or therapy groups that are directed that are that kind of focus on this issue. Um, and then, and then 
planning, planning to, you know, if de deciding what you want to do, leaving is not always the answer for everybody. Um, some people can say, you know, I, I'm not okay with this. And if you don't change, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I am going to leave. And, and that works for some people, but each individual will know whether that's safe for them. Okay. So finding sometimes helping, uh, finding a way to, um, maybe it's through a domestic violence agency online, or maybe it's going to a place, or maybe it's reading a book like mine where it talks about safety suggestions, but, um, you know, really deciding how you're, what's best, how best to handle your situation, mm -hmm. finding people to talk to who can listen and support you and encourage you, but don't have their own agenda about what you should do because survivors don't need somebody to tell them what to do. They've, they've got that plenty of that. They need encouragement for developing that themselves. And, um, you know, unless you're asked if you're, if you're an ally or if you're a therapist, unless you're asked for suggestions, then I hesitate, you know, it's important to, um, to encourage people to think, you know, to ask them questions like, what do you need from me? <laughs> if you're a friend or you're a family member, what, what do you need from me? I'm concerned. And then giving those messages about, you don't deserve this. That is abuse you know, because they may question it. Am I making too big a deal about whatever it is, especially with emotional abuse that often happens. And I will repeat it again. It's like emotional abuse, mental abuse, coercive behavior really is spiritual abuse. It, it, it pushes down your spirit, your ability to express who you are as an individual. And we all have our unique gifts. Mm -hmm. And so that's very abusive. Mm -hmm. And it makes it more difficult also to reach out when someone has begun to feel like they're no good. You know, maybe they take on the toxic thing. Someone that keeps repeating to them, like, you'll never find anybody who's going to love you more than I do. Or, oh, you're no good. You're stupid or whatever. Or one woman, uh, when she was in the group, kept apologizing for everything. Every time she spoke up for everything, she would say, I know I can't really express myself very well. In truth, she was excellent at expressing herself. And so I hung back as the, as the group leader until someone pretty soon said, what in the world are you talking about? Everything you say is just wonderful. And I feel really supported by you. But she believed that because her partner, every time she would try to talk to him about an issue, he would say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't you you don't make any sense. Those kinds of things. Mm. So that's part of Eleanor Roosevelt had a I came upon this quote that all the water in the world will not drown you unless it gets inside of you. And that's what happens with coercive control with somebody who's so you're so intimate with, and they keep saying those things, it's really difficult not to have it affect your self-esteem. It's so true. It's so true. So this is fantastic. So this is about having that opportunity to shift your proximity. But, and that's, in some cases, that's the hardest thing because they control that proximity. So finding a way and then making a decision or learning to make decisions for yourself so you can decide if you're going to stay or you're going to go and what does that look like. This is fantastic. And so a lot of the work that you do with therapists, um, I'd love to know what are the key things aside from asking questions as opposed to telling them what to do, uh, what are the key things that you talk to therapists about and how to support these people to shift their proximity? Well, I have seven uh, interventions that I um, talk about that I present and I have handouts with each of those. Um, and the first three have to do with, are mostly focused on early stages of therapy. Um, so breaking the silence <clears throat> or ending the silence, I like to call it. So being that listening ear, listening, hearing their story, encouraging them with that story. And then sometimes what comes up during that time is their ability to self-regulate, their abil ability to manage strong emotions may may uh, be affected. And so 
Another one is, is self-regulation, um, teaching them ways to kind of help themselves deal with the strong emotions that come up when they're in the midst of chaos with the, in the course of relationship. And even if they've left, you know, oftentimes that continues going through a really difficult divorce and that kind of thing. Um, so self-regulation is another strategy. And then I also teach, um, uh, domination and, um, <clears throat> other forms of trauma domination that happens in other ways, because it's not, it does happen that sometimes, let's say you have somebody who is, um, uh, lesbian or gay, they have often dealt with, uh, domination in another way culturally. And so that trauma or racial trauma, and so that heightens that 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 colors the intimate partner abuse too, and becomes another way in which they um, struggle to be able to be themselves or feel okay about themselves. And so recognizing those is very important. And I call it you're helping people to own their story. Mm -hmm. The story that they often come in with is colored by the abuse that they've had. And so helping them to own their story, labeling what's happening, naming it, it is abuse, uh, it is coercive control or whatever word they wanna use. At first, you wanna use their words. They don't always call it that. And then gradually teaching them that, you know, this is, this is what is happening, helping them to own their story so that they are not seeing themselves through the lens that their abuser wants them to see them themselves through what that person says and then being able to kind of connect the dots in terms of maybe some of the vulnerabilities that they've had although I do want to caution people people can grow up in very health pretty healthy families I mean families all have their own little things <laughs> about them but they can grow up in healthy families and still get into an coercively controlling relationship hmm. maybe it's that they're strong and that person is really, you know, kind of likes that in them, but then they don't like it in the relationship. Um, and uh, they may feel like um, they may be really um, have been educated to be caretakers. And so they might see some vulnerabilities in the person they're having the relationship with and feel bad about them and feel like they can help them, but then they just keep getting deeper and deeper into um, being coercively controlled and being affected by that. Mm -hmm. So that can be, um, it isn't necessarily that they have grown up with domestic abuse in their own families or anything like that. It can still happen. Women, it's the world is changing, but it hasn't completely changed. When we have historically, traditionally, we have been educated to kind of let men interrupt us or, you know, let uh, be caretakers. And all of those are, that's good things. It can be good, but it can also cause us to have an identity that makes us more vulnerable to being controlled by someone else and manipulated. It's complicated. It's complicated. It is com and, um, um, and the patterns of behaviour before aren't necessarily going to be indicators of what they're going to be doing moving forward. Uh, yeah. And so do you do couples therapy or is this just something where you're speaking to therapists? Well, now I'm not doing any therapy, but what I used to do, uh, part of my career, I worked in a, uh, a center. Actually, when I was educated, I did a few abuser treatment groups. So I learned how to do that. But that wasn't what I really, that wasn't what called me. That wasn't my gift. So I didn't continue that. Um, but I worked in a clinic where the uh, other people were doing the abuser treatment, they called it. And then there was also people who worked with children from those families. Uh, and then I did the survivor work and I developed the group work and so forth. And so um, I for, I'm sorry, I forgot the thread of your question. Where were you going? <laughs> so, so I wanted to know, is this something that can be done as a, as a couple? Can couples oh, sit yeah. down to have a level of therapy here? Or is it better to work with 
the survivor or to work with the perpetrator or is it like how how does the structure best for cohesive control not any other subject just that what what is the best way to move forward couples therapy is not recommended for for domestic abuse absolutely not because ordinary couples therapy is geared is is geared toward to assumes that people are equal and there is not equal power in the relationship so therefore all kinds of things can happen within the therapy you know that uh, maybe the abuser will dominate more and of the story and the victim doesn't feel like they can it, that it's safe to share or if they do share something that the abusive person doesn't like when they go home they're going to catch it mm. emotionally physically so it's just not um good a good way to do therapy the only um uh exception to that is there are some abuser treatment programs who incorporate couples therapy in it when they think it's appropriate mm. but they know how to work with course of control they worked with the abusive person so initially you want them to do their separate work and then if if the uh if it is successful on the abusive partners you know or and if the person if it isn't too late for the relationship as far as the victim is concerned or the survivor then you can bring them together but you want to do that with someone who really knows how to help the other person who's may slip back, you know, to help them to be able to do that. Hmm. But initially, you no. Know, yep. Ordinarily, if people specialize in doing couples therapy, I did work with some couples, but what I always did, um, the name of the person isn't coming to me, but I, I um, who developed this, that I would do a three session assessment. And the first session I'd meet with both of them together. And then I always met with each of them alone because then it's going to be safe for you to find out, okay, how do you deal with conflict? What's the history of conflict? But you, you know, you get into, so what's going on? That provides an opportunity for the victim to safely tell you if that's what's going on. Mm. And then if you pick up on that. You, of course, always um, um, ask the person whether or not it's okay if they disclose that, if you disclose what you've heard. But you can always find a way as a therapist to say, okay, given what I'm hearing from each of you, I think it's important for you to do some individual work first. And then you refer the, I would refer the, um, the person who had used abuse to somebody who specialized in that. Mm. Now your book is written specifically for therapists. Is that correct, Jennifer? It is written specifically for survivors and those who care about them, maybe it's a family or friend, and many therapists have found it very helpful for them. Oh, you know, I love that. And the training that you do is for therapists. Is that right? That's the workshops are for therapists. Oh, yes. I love that. So, so Jennifer's links are going to be in the show notes and in the show description. And if you're curious to know more, then the book is a great place to start. And if you're a therapist, reach out to Jennifer and have conversations about her training, uh, which is fascinating. Now, it's online. Is that right, Jennifer? The training's online? The training is sometimes online. So I advertise when I, my next trainings are coming up. And eventually what I'm looking at is developing a course myself so that people can do it at their own, wherever they are and can do it at their own pace. So oh. that's coming. That's, that that, that's very exciting, Jennifer. That's very exciting. So Jennifer, just in closing, what are some words of wisdom you have for our audience today? Oh boy. If I'm speaking to a survivor, any of the survivors out there, it's to know that you don't deserve this. And if I'm speaking to a therapist, listening is the most important thing that you can do. And I don't know, I had often had to, um, I mean, yes, we need to use, you know, help people with specific issues that they bring in, whatever their goals are. Um, but that listening is so important for them to be for them to hear you reflecting, it helps them in terms of working through their own things. Mm. So, Oh, I love that, Jennifer. I love that. 
And if you're listening today and you are a survivor, we run Pamper Days, not just here in South Australia, but globally now. And we're very excited that, the, that, that our charity, Healing Through Love, has gone global. So reach out to Healing Through Love and find out when our next Pamper Day that is in your local city. And we would love to have you for free as a guest in our proximity Think day spa on steroids. It's an amazing environment to be in, to have that level of understanding and compassion. And, you know, it is. It's a place to have therapy. Think makeup, skincare, think facials, think fun things. And, uh, and our local providers do that for free for our beautiful survivors. A beacon of hope, let's look at it that way. And if today you're listening to us and you yourself are a therapist of any description, then reach out to us at Healing Through Love. We're always looking for more participants to come along and assist on these beautiful days. And it really does make a difference. It's a great way to pay it forward and make a difference. And uh, we'd love to have you in our proximity. That's a goodbye from me and a goodbye from Jennifer. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Healing Through Love. You can get further resources, see the show notes, or simply reach out to us via our website at htlaustralia.org. Thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to your company next time on the Healing Through Love podcast. Music.